The Granola Saga feels like a bit like last year's snow. In fact, it's like the kind of snow from two years ago. But still, if you squint and don't think too much about the Bardock part, there are a lot of fun elements that it introduces that changes Dragon Ball forever. And since we haven't seen elements from it in a while, we could do a little bit of analysis since things seem to be set in stone right now. A while ago, we did the Homeworld's Guide, and even before, we discussed alien species in Dragon Ball. But now, we can talk about some of the new ones that were introduced to us by this part of the Dragon Ball Super story. Now, okay, we might be a little bit late to the party, but hey, we have talked about the Mechians, Saiyans, Tuffles, and Freezer's race a lot on this channel. And it just so happens that the next most explored one would appear in that part of the manga. So without further ado, let's talk about Cerulean's. So, at first glance, they're your standard human-like aliens, just with teal green hair. But if you give them a closer look, you will discover their most striking feature. Their right eyes, depending on where you're looking at this from. We do know that they developed in order to improve their sight to ridiculous levels of clarity, becoming a very distinct solid red colour, with the iris and pupil essentially becoming one. Also, we do know that they have much longer lifespans than humans or even Saiyans, but not as long as the Mechian. It's projected that their average lifespan is about 200 years or so. And as stated by Toyotaro in an interview from August 2022, their fighting prime is long, like in the case of the Saiyans. Although with a life as long as that, well, Saiyans would be begging to be able to punch each other in the face for that period of time. Although this makes their childhoods really, really, really short when you compare them to the overall length of their existence. But still, they are strong and active for the most part, and they have almost two centuries to develop. It seems that they got the best of both worlds, in fact. And despite that particular trait, they seem much more docile, much more peaceful than the people of planet Vegeta, and are able to peacefully coexist with a group of Namekian settlers that they share their world with. It is worth noting that their sniper eye adaptation would point out their being natural hunters as they might have evolved by being able to spot the moving prey or find their weaknesses easily. But this is our conjecture for the most part, based on how stuff works in the real world and how it would be then transposed into Dragon Ball. But it would make sense though if you think about it. Granola is said to be particularly good at using his sight, almost a savant, as he is capable of seeing the weak points of his enemies through careful observation of their micro movements of the muscles or their blood flow. It gets that granular. Now, the most well-known member of this race and protagonist of his own saga also got an upgrade to his abilities, an evolved left eye, which developed his sight even further. It is worth noting that this is a mere transformation, as in it is revertible and would fall down if the fighter lost stamina in terms of performance. I am kind of wondering if he is the first Cerulean to get this, or if this is their equivalent of Super Saiyan or something. The manga kind of glosses over that part, despite initially it seemingly being like a big deal or something, it just doesn't go anywhere. But that isn't the first time that's happened in Dragon Ball, something that appears to be really cool not going anywhere. It would be interesting to see how the other members of his race would react to such a development, but we don't have many of them left around because he's the only one left. In fact, if Granola's timer is out by the time of Superhero, we don't have any more around. Yeah, oh, Granola by Superhero might be dead. Still, okay, let's get back on track, as there are quite a few more things that we can take out of the manga that could provide us with some information about them. We don't know much about their overall culture, but the biggest element that we see throughout the entire saga is their architecture. Now, Bojack, oh, he loves architecture. He would love Cerulean's. Also, it mostly seems to be stone and wood-based, something that becomes rather interesting later on when the Shugarians settle on cereal. It doesn't scream primitive per se, more like the Cerulean's have a traditional architecture. Cerulean's give out that vibe of people who don't really feel like traveling a whole lot. They don't get out much and are happy with what they have on their planet. 
they've got a routine, they've got stuff that works, and that's something they're okay with. They're quite happy with what they've got. Now, one fun and absolutely irrelevant fact is that we even know what their measurement unit is that granola uses. It could be a standard on cereal, or in this section of space, chia seeds, or chia seeds, or chia seeds. When gas materializes his daggers, Oatmeal notes, there are 46 of them within a 50 chia seed radius. It might mean absolutely nothing, or it could possibly mean everything. As is the case with Toriyama and Toyotaro, but we thought this was a little bit of a fun trivia that might have glossed you over. We have three named members of their race, with the main one not needing any further introduction because we've mentioned their name long enough. If you've interacted with the manga in any shape or form, you know Granola, so let's just skip over. He is a slightly edgy but ultimately likeable bounty hunter and part-time protagonist of the saga. And as we mentioned before, due to his wish deal with Torombo, the poor guy is most likely dead at this point. It is a shame, though, that we didn't get to see a proper conclusion to his fate. We just get a handshake from him and Vegeta, and then he goes bye-bye. But it is worth mentioning that he got really psychotic, didn't he? Really fast, too, for someone who was acting very professional and cold beforehand. We don't think that this is something inherently cerulean, but rather the effect of one's traumas and sudden power surges mixing together. Now the next major member of this race is Muesli, Granola's mother. She is pretty tough and composed and seems to be brave enough to stand up to Bardock when she considers him a threat to the lives of her and her son. We don't get to spend too much time with her, as she features mostly in the flashback sequences, and her demise is the main source of Granola's trauma. Well, that and when he discovered that he had unintentionally brought her demise, yeah, that is one of the things I find is a bit of a pitfall for the saga. It's like, hey, Granola, you killed your mom. There is one last Cerulean that we should mention, and that is Flake. He doesn't have much in terms of a story, as he is most notable for destroying the Cerulean moon to stop the great apes from, well, aping up. He ends up being killed by Eventual Taro, one of Bardock's comrades, so, you know, an eye for an eye and all that. Now, the one spicy thing about him is the fact that Toriotaro wrote him with the intention of Flake being Granola's father in the early drafts. It was, however, not discussed with Toriyama, so it's more or less his headcanon. It didn't really go anywhere, but it's something he would have liked to have explored more. It never became a plot point for the actual story. And, you know, we won't even go into the details about the name puns, as in this case, these name puns are so painfully obvious that we were not going to insult your intelligence by attempting to explain them. So yeah, we're not going to do that this time. And that's the most stuff we can discuss about Ceruleans. While they have some stuff, it's nothing when compared to the likes of some longtime favourites like the Saiyans or the Namekians. However, we're not quite done, as we have two other species that have been featured and remained undiscussed by us. The next one is already hinted at earlier in the script. We mean, of course, the Shigarians. Now these cute axolotl-like aliens are the new inhabitants of Planet Serial, ever since the heat has sold the world to them. They do seem rather peaceful and placid, and don't mind Granola's company one bit. We also have some insights into their everyday lives, with their housing being a stark contrast to the old architecture of Serial. Very futuristic, as they live in those modern bubble cities, which don't resemble any structure that had been seen on the planet before. This is stuff that they brought from their other world. It is true that this might be something that the heaters had designed for them as part of the package, but seeing that they have lived in their new homeworld for decades, it does seem that they have at least adapted quite well. They also seem to have a pop culture, as we're introduced to their version of television. We know at least of the news channel and of the song Sugar Toast Love. Is it a song though? Or is it some kind of weird audition contest thing? It's hard to say, as it seems to talk about the importance of a tasty breakfast. Propaganda for breakfast? It's hard to argue with that. Other than that, well, uh, they're, they're cute, okay? This is their character trait. They're like Plantians, if they weren't annoying. Honestly, we don't hear their voices, so maybe that's why they're winning the cute off in a way, because we don't have to hear what they sound like? Yeah, probably. Bardock would have probably hated them anyway. Still, there isn't that much substance to them. They are mostly used as a contrast to Granola being edgy and unable to move on with his life, being the Dragon Ball equivalent of Shadow the Hedgehog. And later on, so he can realise that he is turning into a monster that he used to detest, that he's slowly becoming a villain toward the Shigarians. 
We don't even have a named one of those Shigerians to really bounce off of them. So we don't even have any name puns for you. I doubt we'll ever even know any, because as far as we're concerned, they're dumb. They're done so. We're not going to see them again. But still, we have one more alien species to discuss, and that's the race of the Heaters. Yeah, 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 once again, we have new people with no names, but at least we have some fun tidbits about them. So here we go. They do seem to have elongated lifespans, as any of them have hardly aged in 40 years between the start of their introduction and the present day. They're also known to be wearing those restraining beads that keep them from entering their enraged, berserker-like stages. And when it comes to designs, other than pale blue skin, they seem to bear a resemblance to Yautja, otherwise known as the Predators. But unlike Kula, they seem to take more from their unmasked looks with the dreadlocks and the tusk fangs that appear once they go crazy. They also seem to be one of those species in Dragon Ball that are completely space-proof, as we can see Gas fighting in space. They were created to be kind of the antithesis to Frieza and his clan. Instead of family rivalry motivating them, they seem, at least at first glance, to closely work together and have each other's backs. Which is true, unless you're a lack. They also depend on information rather than raw power, and their names are based upon different types of heaters, which is obviously the opposite of the name puns of old Freezy Pops and his family, which I still find really, really appealing. Also, even though they were his underlings, they do have their own agenda, and they try to get the entire cake for themselves all the time. Now, it's hard to talk about their combat abilities, as we've only really seen the likes of Gas fighting and nobody else. And most of his skill set was demonstrated after the wish on Torombo was made, which is kind of cheating. That being said, we know that he is the strongest of the four anyway, whilst Alec is probably the weakest. Oil and Maki, they seem to be roughly about the same level. And in the interview with Toyotaro that we already talked about, Toyotaro and Victory Uchida kind of said about their power level around uh, Abel and Kado from the Yo Son Goku and his friends return, so above the Ginyu Force, but definitely below Namek Saga Frieza. Of course, this all changed with the wish on Torombo, but that's kind of obvious. Also, there might be more heaters knocking around, either other members of the family or different representatives of their species. The ones that were hinted to exist, though probably will never appear again, are the parents of the quartet. Now, while Granola and thus the Cerulean's and the Heaters were pitched by Toyotaro and corrected by Toriyama, the Shigarians have been the Old Master's own creation, something that the artist formerly known as Toybal had found rather adorable in the I want to protect them sort of way. Anyway, one of the best elements of the Granola saga was the little microcosmos of Planet Serial, with all three races serving a purpose and being connected to each other in this self-contained story. Really, if it wasn't for the Bardock stuff, it would have been the perfect definition of a nice side story. It would be nice to see Monato one day again, or to discover if Granola survived or not and was able to reverse the process of dying in three years. Hopefully, we'll also see Oil and Maki again as members of Freezer's force and not be just pushed off to a random planet somewhere and forgotten. Maybe they can rise above the position of chefs. Shigarians, sadly, don't have a big chance of returning in a role that won't be just as a glorified cameo because there's no real point to them being around. Now, while Granola the Survivor Saga had many issues, we don't exactly hate the lore elements of it that were added. And we hope that you learned something new today, as some of these tidbits weren't really widely covered. Maybe in the future, we'll be able to look through more of Uchida and Toyotara's interviews, as sometimes their headcanons are quite interesting. Anyway, that's it for today. What was your favourite species from the saga? And would you like to see more from the likes of Granola and the remaining likes of the Heaters? Be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Catch you later!